Um, thank you. Um, as we heard in the first panel discussion of today uh, from the chair, Dr. Chris Donegan, um, a significant percentage of tech startups fail as faster moving company comes in and overtakes them. Um, you therefore very often want to be that fastest mover in the technology sector. And today we'll discuss some of the issues and challenges uh, faced uh, by um, these fast moving companies in management of their IP. Um, so I'll introduce my panel. Um, uh, starting from the end, uh, we have um, Nelly Simon. Uh, Nelly is Director of Digital Transformation at the EUIPO uh, and is in charge of uh, strategic planning, in, uh, including the introduction of management tools within the EUIPO, uh, and is in charge of the EUIPO's IT department, contributing to the transformation of technology from a supporting corner of, to a driving force of, uh, for innovation. Uh, Nelly's professional experience uh, ranges from entrepreneurial activities in technology startups to management consultancy in strategy, uh, organisational development and innovation, um, particularly in the fields of financial and automotive sectors. Uh, next to Nelly is John Calvert. John's the CEO and co-founder of Clearview IP, an innovation and IP strategy consultancy uh, he started in 2007. Uh, which delivers bespoke IP strategy services that help clients maximise the value and monetization potential of their IP. Uh, such services include competitive intelligence and landscape reports, IP strategy planning and implementation, uh, innovation capture and management, IP licensing, valuation and strategic IP acquisition. And thirdly, at my immediate right, we have Margaret Hartnett. Uh, Margaret's the director in run this way. of <laughs> legal and patent uh, patents are ID scan biometrics. Um, just to explain why she's wandering over there. <laughs> uh, over. To break up all the uh, all the chat we've had today, Margaret's brought a, uh, a short demo presentation yeah, get her working. Uh, to uh, give a nice practical demo of uh, okay. company's products. Um, the ID scan biometrics is a company with leading innovations and products in the field of AI led identity solutions uh, such as face recognition tools. Um, Margaret's also a patent attorney and researcher within ID Scan and plays a key role in the sales process to deliver revenue growth, lead key innovation projects, and establish and maintain ID Scan's growing patent portfolio. <laughs> so. Thank you. I just want to show you a very quick demo because I love tech. And I just want to give you a very brief <laughs> view of what this stuff is about. It's brilliant. Uh, let's see if we can get this working. So ID scan, well, the name says it all. It's all about uh, scanning identity documents, passports, driving licenses, visas. It can be done from uh, dedicated passport scanners, but increasingly our clients are looking for us to do this off a mobile phone. In addition, we use face recognition techniques to compare the face of a person from the selfie against the face on the passport document. And that would be on the visible uh, biographical page and similarly by interrogating the RFID chip. So this just very quickly gives you an idea of what's going on. Um, I would have shown you my passport, but bearing in mind this has been recorded and streamed, I really don't <laughs> want to have a load of people at my, f at my flat in the next month. The, fl uh, the, the fridge is empty, honest. So this is just giving you an idea of what the, the kind of flow you go through using the app. And this is all being done from a mobile phone. So you can see that um, our software uses implement or implements uh, advanced AI techniques to do um, uh, computer-based vision for a dedicated OCR. It's not a standard OCR um, engine. It has to be tailored to the unique aspects of identity documents. Um, and here's a three-way check on the face. You, <laughs> you'd be surprised at different types of um, sophistication of fakes you can get. And here you can see, these are, this is just a very brief rundown of some of the outputs you get. KYC is know your customer, AML is any money laundering. We will do these checks um, on the individuals based on the information scraped off the passport driving license. It will be cross-referenced in some cases against other forces, sources of information or even cross-referenced within the document itself. And PEPs is politically exposed persons. This is a particular regulatory check and required by many banks. 
and and so I'll, I'll, I'll leave over to the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Excellent. Thanks very much. Um, so first of all, first question, I think directly referring to the uh, panel topic title, um, what, what's the difference between the role of responsibility for IP um, and the role of management of IP in a business uh, and ultimately who sort of owns it um, and can the, those responsible for management be actually different to those responsible for the IP itself? Uh, I'll start of asking Nelly. Yeah, do you want uh, if I may to go uh, just one step before answering your question because you know I come from a a trademark and design office, registration office. And that is more or less maybe part of that trio of the good, the bad, and the ugly because we are the guys that might make it a little bit difficult for SMEs or small businesses to register directly and easily without attorneys there. Uh, their IP. So we look a lot into the behavior of the market and the SMEs and one of the numbers that I was just pulling up was saying that uh, although the majority of SMEs in Europe will consider themselves innovative, just 9% of them do something with their IP rights. Uh, now the question is why? Um, and that goes back to whose responsibility is that management and you know the managing the IP or being responsible for the IP. Uh, I, I have, it's, it would be a little bit forward of me to talk about patents. I haven't worked with patents a lot. It has always been trademark and registered design. Even as an entrepreneur, uh, I, I have been working with, uh, with, with trademark and, and, and design. So uh, I try to keep it general, but bear in mind that it might not apply everything that I say to all different IP rights. Uh, now, in terms of IP responsibility and management, I think there is no way, and at least in a small company, and although you might think about product development, cash flow in a growing business, about sales and marketing, there is no way you cannot think about IP. There is no way it cannot be part of I don't see it being outsourced, uh, but it might be a very personal view. Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> I, didn't, I wouldn't say that it's not <laughs> complimentary. We, have, we are going to go there. I think you might need outside counsel. Not that you don't need it, but totally and completely outsourcing the strategy uh, would, be very, would sound very strange to me. It's part of your business. It's part of your path. It might be a part that brings a lot of cash flow. And just totally hand it over uh, sounds, sounds very strange to me. I wouldn't, I wouldn't think that you could do that. That said, doesn't mean that, you know, of course you can't. And we do that ourselves. The EU IPO has some, t we, we deliver tools. We do have to, if you have ever seen our page, there are loads of different technology gadgets that you can work with, uh, with, you know, Im image search for your, for your design or for figurative trademarks. All of them are developed or in a way or another work with other software companies. So we are involved with that. And and believe me, our core business is law. You cannot find probably in a patent office in EPO or USPTO, but in a play, I haven't seen a place with more lawyers on site than our office with 1,000 people around. And we still look for outside counsel from time to time. When we look into very specific issues, we bring people in. But that doesn't mean that they take the responsibility or the strategy for the things that we do. So the, from my point of view, I think there is, there's the the responsibility, the ultimate responsibility is within, especially in this growing, growing business, is within the owners. I mean, mm. that's their yeah. future. You can't hand over your yeah. future to, you know, however good an outside counsel is. Um, the the day-to-day -day management or working with it, it needs a little bit yeah. more of knowledge. I so mean, you know I'm saying, so you're saying that responsibility remains with the core yes. business owners. Yes. Perhaps the management of yes. that is the bit that, that could be outsourced. What I, but that is what you perfectly okay. summarised. John, you might have a take on this. Yeah, it might not be different, <laughs> though. Um, I think, so I've got um, t two responsibilities. I'm a uh, founder of uh, Clearview IP, so we provide management consulting advice around intellectual property, so I would say you should outsource as much as you possibly can. <laughs> um, but, but I'm also chairman of a genomics company, which is a Series A funded company, and in that context, I would agree that the responsibility of IP absolutely lies with the company. 
So, and that lies in my mind with the board of the company. Actually, yeah. as chairman of the board, I have in my written objectives IP management or ownership. Mm -hmm. So I help in that context as a director. I actually am the last mm -hmm. person in the chain where the buck stops an IP. But in terms of actually implementing yes. an IP strategy, actually coming up with the best IP strategy, um, in the genomics company and fitness genes, we actually use outside resources. We use patent attorney firms. We also use Clearview IP. Um, and we use other resources as appropriate to achieve our objectives. So it's really horses for courses in, in that respect. Um, I think there is a difference between responsibility and therefore accountability okay. and mm -hmm. management. And so quite often someone that has the responsibility should be held accountable. So when it goes wrong, um, they mm -hmm. deal with it, have the, you know, they shoulder that responsibility. The manager of an IP process, and we see this in many of our clients in Clearview, mm -hmm. is often called an IP manager. They do manage IP matters. Often that is just managing the prosecution or building the patent portfolio. It's not necessarily including trademarks mm -hmm. and other IP rights. So we think responsibility definitely at a board level. At a management level, there needs to be one person that does manage IP, mm. but probably using, in some cases, virtual resources to help them achieve their objectives. Excellent. Margaret, is that in line with your thoughts on the topic, or do you um, have any other takes Somewhat, on that? but I, I think we have to kind of step back a little bit and get a sense of context. What exactly is IP for a fast-moving company? And what is a fast-growing fast company, for example? You know, get a sense of scale here. For example, ID Scan, at one point, its revenue was tripling within 18 months. Right, think about this. What does it take to deliver a product and a service reliably to your customers when your revenue is growing at that pace? It means you're growing your customers that fast as well. Oh. Yes, I am an IP manager, but in a company that small growing that fast, actually I do everything, short of making the tea. <laughs> 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 that's a fact of life. Yeah. That's a really good point. I was going to come back to that with the, the pace of the growth of the company reconciling with yeah. the speed of acquiring IP rights. Mm -hmm. I'll come back to that. Um, so more broadly, firstly, um, what is the objective of an IP management strategy? What are you, what are you trying to achieve in establishing one within a fast-growing company? That, I'll start straight to John. I, I'll have a go at first. I mean, so we, we, uh, we, back to your outside counsel thing, we don't have any lawyers or patent attorneys in our team, so we can't provide legal advice. Um, we think of IP as just a, uh, an intangible asset, a part of a mm -hmm. business, and in generating any business opportunity, you want to maximise the return for investors and shareholders. Mm -hmm. So you're literally caring about increasing enterprise value. If a business is likely to go through a funding round um, or multiple funding rounds and ultimately an exit, which could be a trade sale or IPO, then you want to maximise enterprise va value at all points. Um, you also want to maximise certainty of transaction. So a funding round, Series A, you want an investor to be able to, we've talked about ticking boxes, we want different investors, by the way, do look um, into much more detail in the IP. So you want to make sure you, that they can all tick that box. So you've got to have mm. enough of an IP position and a good IP mm. story and be able to demonstrate that your IP position is solid and contributing to the value that, or underpinning the value of your revenue mm. product services. When you come to an exit, um, you want to increase enterprise value. You also want to increase certainty of exit. So when Microsoft bought SwiftKey, I'm sure they did a very thorough due diligence process. Um, and at that time, if they find things aren't right, and th there are things missing, there are questions of ownership, there are license agreements that are all over the place, that's the sort of thing they use to negotiate down the price. Mm. So certainty of exit, mm. maximizing enterprise value, and actually stopping the purchaser or the IPO environment causing you to have to price more cheaply than you wanted to. Mm. And in a, a former life in Xyrotex, we did a NASDAQ listing in 2004, and just before we well, we filed for IPO, um, and then we got lots of people wanting to share in our success and license their patents to us. And that became material to the IPO, and we had to settle those issues and deal with them mm. before we could actually list on the market, because it was going to affect our price. Right. So in that instance, we're thinking about you know, building enterprise value, having the right kind of assets at the time you need them to convey the right story, and then having certainty of exit. The third thing, which is 
about continuity is management of risk. So IP events can disrupt you, and that's usually a third party that has IP rights that want to um, license them to you, or it's a litigation or so on. Um, and those are things that are disruptive. They're disruptive because usually the management team in a small high growth tech company don't have that much experience of dealing with those issues, so they have to learn about them quickly. They're then distracted. They might cost money. They need lawyers. So all of those things are stopping them doing the 300% growth in 18 mm. months that a tech startup wants to achieve. Mm. So those three things. Yeah. And Margaret, within um, RDScan, um, d is there any difference from what John said about uh, formulation of an IP management strategy that you would say from your own experience? Um, yeah, absolutely. The reality is, it's panic stations. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> you know, I mean, how do you manage I, panic? I, I do it very well, and I've maintained that whole swan disposition. I'm not panicked. Oh God! Realistically, um, my biggest concerns are: how do I recruit enough people with the right skill sets to enable me to deliver the product? How do I design contracts that mean that I can recognise the revenue in whichever way I need to do according to the particular financial year? How do I ensure that I'm, uh, again, negotiate my contracts to ensure that a very large person isn't going to try to control costings into the future? Yes, they do. Um, IP strategy. Uh, well, when my techies say that they've invented something new, I think, oh, great, let's go ahead, let's file something for it. If they say, I'm going to talk at a conference, OK, please, just tell me what you're going to do before you do it. <laughs> but do I sit down and plan a massive strategy around it? No. <laughs> Honestly, no. Actually, that n leads nicely on to the next question, actually. Can different business units um, in a company have conflicting interests in formulating an IP management strategy? Um, I, you mentioned about inventors being very keen to tell the world about their latest innovation. And to s some extent, marketing, PR, you want to get out there. You want to be the, the first in, in the tech sector to be promoting this. Yet, from the uh, protection of the IP side of things, you obviously must ensure all your IP rights are in place and filed before such disclosure takes place. Mm -hmm. so that's one that's example of conflicting interest. Can you think of others? Well, first of all, I don't think it has to be a conflicting, and that's actually one of the biggest things I find with communicating with scientists, is they assume that filing a patent application has to take forever. It doesn't have to. Yes, it might mean you're drafting into the middle of the night, but frankly, if needs must, you do it. You can turn around these things quickly. They may not be beautiful, but they don't have to be beautiful. <laughs> um, and you know, also, we, we've focused a lot on patents, but for us, and you can probably tell from the nature of the products we sell, patents probably are, yes, they are a useful component, but they're not the dominant form of IP. The dominant form of IP is the stuff that you can't really describe in a sense of a patent. It will never be patented. It's the stuff that's in people's head. So how do we protect that? By non-compete clauses in their employment contracts. How do we protect uh, you know, um, our customer records? Mm -hmm. Frankly, InfoSec. We have damn good security on our networks. That's really how we go about it. If, I'm not sure if that's a strategy, but that's, that's how we do it. The, <laughs> all part of the plan. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you're aware of it, that's oh, right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Nelly, you got any other comments on that point? Um, what we have seen, not from my work now, but before, uh, is that many times, indeed, inventors or people that come up with the innovation, they want to stick with it. That's the baby. That they want to work on it. Mm. They want to work a little. Sometimes it just, it just the balance of cost and benefit, and does it make sense to go for a patent, and does it make sense to work mm. a little bit more on it, just doesn't pay off. So yes, mm. indeed, we have seen that in companies where you say, look, this is go either this is going nowhere, or from a strategy point of view, look, licensing might make more sense mm. at this point of time, whatever you've got uh, in that value chain that you've mm. got. So yes, in, in, indeed they are, but I think that's why in the end the board has to have the say when they can balance the benefit and the cost. And you know, inventors I think sometimes are not the best, you know, cost mm. benefit balancers. You know? um, one of the, let's say we've taken all these factors into account and we've got our IP strategy, at least that's relevant for right now. 
Um, what factors can then change a company's IP management strategy or their objectives? Um, thinking about internal or external factors, uh, maybe being reactive or proactive, company maturity. Um, John? Um, l lots of different things could cause mm -hmm. you to change your strategy. I think one that um, surprises are often things that mm -hmm. change your IP strategy. Certainly um, if you get sued um, for patent <laughs> infringement, that always changes your strategy. Yeah. <laughs> um, those little things. Those things. Um, <laughs> Change of major shareholders or change of major stakeholders on the board. Mm -hmm. So if you get a very IP savvy and IP interested board member, mm -hmm. guess what, your st strategy is going to change, you'll start to do more IP stuff. Um, one of the biggest factors we've seen with clients, and we've actually helped orchestrate this sometimes, is where the right thing for the company to do is probably sh shift the emphasis in their IP strategy. And it might be towards trade secrets, actually, because they're mm -hmm publishing everything through the patenting process and they, they probably should keep more of it secret. Sometimes it's you have to use external data to convince a board to invest more money or to change a strategy. So competitive benchmarking or a new entrant coming into their market, the competitive landscape changing usually changes the IP strategy and often for the good. Yeah. So we, we sometimes will, and one particular client, um, they actually at a board level wanted to improve their innovation so a very top level, we want more innovation. They wanted a market <laughs> impacting IP strategy, um, but they didn't necessarily know what that was. Mm. So uh, at those times, what we did was we actually looked at the one competitor that they cared about and we benchmarked the number of patents per R&D dollar they were achieving and they were five times behind their competitor. Well, that changed their IP strategy. Because yeah. as soon as the board could see that one metric and it was only one metric, bang, mm. we're doing something different. So data can help change yeah. your strategy as well. Mm. Not right. uh, uh, simply audits. Um, <laughs> audits. <laughs> audits. <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> can you expand being, on that? <laughs> perhaps I'm being too honest. Um, when you, you start engaging with very large clients, they will audit you. And all of a sudden, they're going to start asking questions about your processes, your procedures, mm. your policies. Once you start doing RFPs with very large clients, they'll start looking for all this stuff as well. All of a sudden, you realize, oh, God, we don't have it. Oh God, what are we going to do? Do something about it quick. <laughs> That's really, for us, probably the major driving force. <laughs> I, I know I sound like we fly by the seat of our pants. No, not necessarily. <laughs> no way. No, no, I have ever been. <laughs> I mean, yeah, of course we have long-term goals. We, we want to dominate the market, of course. Yeah, and, and then the world. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, but like, you know, let's be realistic about it. What can I do within the confines, the, the limited number of hours in the day, the limited number of people I have to, d to help me do it, and uh, within the, limit, the, the vast number of things that are being thrown at me at the same time? Mm. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, audits. Probably one of the best ways. <laughs> you, you need one of these. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so, if we've uh, uh, formulated an IP management strategy and the business owners are involved and they're accepting that this is their responsibility, um, uh, to what extent should this, or do you feel this IP strategy should be communicated through the business? I mean, at one extreme, you've got it great with formulated it, it's written locked away in a safe somewhere in the boardroom, or the entire firm knows exactly what the uh, business is looking to achieve through their IP. H how, how do you find that balance, do you think? Margaret? Do you want me to? <laughs> <laughs> well, the idea of sticking, uh, p uh, generating an IP strategy as a document and sticking in a safe, that's bizarre. <laughs> Why? Um, in terms I was hoping of you'd say that. Yeah, <laughs> it's completely, totally ludicrous. Yeah. Um, and in terms of everybody in the company knowing the objectives, well, again, it would be fairly obvious. Generate revenue. Hmm. I'm sorry, but that's what it's all about. Why? Because I need revenue to pay your salaries at the end of the month. It's basic. But then really. making that link between what you're doing with the IP, yeah, it's easy to tell them we want to make money to pay you. Yeah. But then how's that linked to the IP? I mean, if I, I can give an example of uh, a yeah. client I've work with and they started up from in the automotive sector mm -hmm. um, and it's been very important for the management to communicate to the engineers in the R&D sector what they're planning on doing, the areas they're looking to protect, what they're doing with the uh, patent portfolio they're growing, mm -hmm. why they're growing it, communicate the importance of IP and this comes back to a point that's been made a couple of times, Steve mentioned it in the last session about education. 
mm -hmm. education about the value of the IP so that the engineers know that aside from their intense day-to-day -day, um, research technical work they should be bearing in mind um, putting through the invention submissions liaising with whoever the appointed IP contact is mm -hmm. um, so uh, from, from my perspective I can see communication throughout the firm is uh, a company is, is very important I don't know I think you know, again, we have to give techies the credit because, because they're brilliant people. They really are. One, they're probably more aware of their competitors than we are. Mm -hmm. You know, because these guys are probably in the pub with them. You know, they know what's <laughs> going on. Sharing their IP. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Um, They also know not to go and blab about it in the pub. Why? Because they know it's their jobs at stake. You know, it's simple, really. And who wants to see what they've been doing and find it copied, you know, uh, six months later, or probably even faster in our industry? Who wants? Nobody wants to see that because people feel personal about the IP they mm. create. Okay, they're employed to create it, but it's their baby, mm. and they don't want to see somebody else rip them off. So yeah, it's cool. Mm. <laughs> Nelly, do you have any thoughts on uh, communication? Yes, I, com I, for me, communication is key, honestly, and not only about IP, but about everything else that you do. We ourselves, as, a, as an institution, are a thousand people, and we have, as an institution, strategy to implement um, in a given certain time. And the biggest, biggest challenge has been to communicate it in a way that everybody understands where we want to go. And not only about IP, but how we manage uh, our, our users, which are actually most of you guys here, mm. what we want, how we want to answer them when they call and say, look, trademark, how can I do that? Do I need a, you know, an attorney? Can I file it myself? And just not pick up the phone and say, yes, you can, and thank you very much, <laughs> because they have 14 seconds to answer a phone call. That's their KPI. So <laughs> it's very important, actually, to explain to them that, you know, how you work with them, get them through, because it's for us extremely important. Trademarks are not as complicated, and you know that better than I do, not as complicated as patents are. As an SME, you really need less than 10 minutes if you come to our sites to just put your trademark to a fast track and get it in, in a record time actually granted. Uh, but people have that don't have that, that feeling that they can do that. So it's very important for us to communicate where do we want to go, what kind of needs the users have, and not only our client facing people but the rest of the people because if you have imagine you have a tech issue you are forwarded to one of our techs and you know and you say, no you can't do that maybe tomorrow bang and uh, you know these are the things that all of them is about communication all of it so i can and for me it has been because i have done that 4000 people it has been one of the biggest challenges to bring it home hmm. uh, and not only with a KPI but that really feel it's what are we here to do and uh, so uh, essential for me personally thanks um, so can I can I just co yeah please as do, well? please um, do. I think the thing with an IP strategy is it can be a document that's a few pages long um, it actually needs to be quite simple because mm -hmm. IP there's lots of different IP rights that behave in different legal ways in different jurisdictions and it's a very hard thing to explain right. to anyone without boring them to death for, for months <laughs> on end. So, and actually for a board of directors to get it and to invest you know, R&D and, and innovation money in protecting inventions with patents which are expensive and all of that stuff, you need to do things like you know, patents per revenue dollar mm. and simple metrics and things that people can communicate what's necessary. Now down to the implementation of resources in, in a company and R&D people, I challenge Margaret's view about engineers. Of, 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 you know, don't, don't necessarily go down the pub because you've got this whole open source software community that collaborate online. Mm -hmm. You've got the millennials and the next generation that do everything online, not just collaborate. Mm -hmm. So there's actually a whole culture of open communication, of sharing, of of distributing, and of collaborative development, which is mm -hmm. driving a behaviour that's quite different than. I've got a trade secret, I've locked it in a safe with <laughs> level C2 confidentiality that only three people know about. Mm. A, lot of new yeah. a lot of new mm. businesses, when they're starting with founders, they don't know about the IBM confidential levels that I learned about as a teenager. <laughs> you know, those things, they don't have that experience, mm. that corporate experience. So actually, I think an IP strategy needs to be written down, it needs to be communicated, but communicated in a translated way yes. into systems and processes that, and behaviours that people mm. can can yeah. then behave you know, pr appropriately. So that's academics knowing about disclosure. 
before mm. they go to conferences. It's engineers knowing things are confidential so they don't leak them down the pub just because they like to show off with each other how inventive yeah. they are. Mm. You know, you have to think about the context and I think you need those controls in place. So everyone should know about IP in the right digestible message that they can actually affect their behaviour mm. to the greater good of the company. Can I come back to you then? I'm, I'm sorry, I'll have to do it. Yeah, no, it's, um, it's meant to be yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I agree with you. There is an entirely new uh, modality of behaviour ongoing. It's sociologically, it's fascinating. Does, is it, does it have to be threatening? No, mm. absolutely not. Open mm. innovation, brilliant. We can't invent it all ourselves. Yep. Definitely not. Mm. It's, uh, you know, um, recognising that and also recognizing how you behave within a community in itself is not alien to, I dare I say, young people. They're quite used to the idea that they can be part of an open source community and they still want to get paid at the end of the day. So, you know, they do understand the dynamics and the difference between what can be shared within an open source community and if they're doing it in their spare time as opposed to if they're doing it in a business context as part of their employment, yes, there's always going to be a degree of tension. And that's another thing. If you deal with a company and they're saying to you, oh, we, we don't use any open source, I'd almost say they're either lying or they're delusional because the reality is they, they are using it. Mm -hmm. yes. That's just, mm. the, bottom, that's just yes. the nature of it. We collaborate all the time. In fact, the face recognition project that we're doing, um, that I, I supervise, um, we're doing with the University of Hertfordshire. It's great. Well, yes, we have a collaboration agreement in place, but that's actually a requirement under the funding regime. It's a KTP, a Knowledge Transfer Partnership, requires you to have an IP agreement in place before you get the grant funding. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's not a big thing. Yeah, I guess I just think that the, um, it's better to educate the workforce about the, where the lines might be drawn on things that are open and can be collaborated, mm -hmm. open source, let's say as an example, and those that are absolutely crown jewels that will be locked in a safe. and. Mm -hmm. And I think that I'll say the threat of not being able to pay your salary through losing your job, like the recent Apple case, mm. <laughs> um, is, is not actually enough. You want actually your team to see the value in the innovation that they're creating mm -hmm. um, and want to um, actually have the right, I'll say, faith and lo loyalty in the company to mm. keep that IP within the company to help build the value. So I think it's better to build those good behaviours than yeah. maybe mm. uh, punish the bad ones. No, I agree <laughs> with you. Just a yeah. <laughs> Positivism is great. <laughs> um, but again, it does really come down to the basics of have to pay your salary. Now I agree with you, people, and you know, the techies I work with, they're creative people. Mm. They value what they've created because they've created it. Um, and that's, th that's a very different mentality in itself. You know what I mean? Because they value it for its own being, mm. rather than, mm. as you say, the connection between the salary and the job the two different things. Yeah. Well that's why the education yeah. needs to come in and mm. the communication and well, the, it, I, uh, I don't know. they don't work in little silos, they need to know in the wider context why their innovation, what they do, yeah, but they're being paid to do. With, it? with a very small company, typically your, your hardcore techies are probably the key people who have created the tech from the outset. Mm. They have a very personal sense of ownership which probably isn't correct, but do you know what I mean? Mm. They, as I said, it is their baby that drives it. Mm. Um, for me to sanctimoniously lecture them, it would be wrong. It just wouldn't, wouldn't do it. But you know, if I may jump in, yeah. they don't necessarily connect that uh, sense of ownership to ma money and salary. Many of our uh, techies tell me, you know, probably they would do the same job because they love it even for half the money. Because they just want to have, we have a lot of resources, they can play with all the new gadgets. You know, they love just being in our premises and work with these guys, even for half of the money. And we have, and when you are there... You're selling you, it to me, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> and there you are, I have, to, I have been told more than once, you know, that, you know, even if I don't get the promotion, that's fine, you know. Uh, because <laughs> as long as I get the newer version of the gadget <laughs> you know, to work with. In, in your case, you, but you need to make money out of it. Mm, and if yeah. the education is not there, many things can go wrong because they do, those guys are actually very innovative, very creative. Mm. 
have a different, totally different relationship to how to sustain a company and that you need to pay the bills at the end of the month. You know, well, um, that's my feeling. I'm to quickly bring it back yeah. to because we're sh running out of time. A bit oh, here. Yeah. Can so we not come, please? Just one. Go on then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. You're going to anyway. Yeah, I am. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so the path of least resistance. But <laughs> <laughs> we'll make it quick. Yeah, well, <laughs> to give you another sense of context, mm -hmm. AI recruitment is probably one of the most competitive areas of recruitment yeah. there is. Mm -hmm. People will move. Mm -hmm. The salaries in London for AI specialists is staggering. Mm -hmm. I don't know of any AI developer who would say, yeah, I'll do it for half the price. No, they're looking all the time. And they don't even have to look. They're getting offers mm -hmm. all of the time. Yeah. I've, been, I've actually been approached myself, head of AI in some firms, particularly in the US, and not just US, but also in, in the UK, you're looking at a salary of probably in the region of up to £200,000 per annum. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't What's that an hourly rate? <laughs> <laughs> That's just 125, staggering. 125, yeah. 30. <laughs> <laughs> if I could get £200,000, bloody hell, I'd be out there straight. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> Different species, yes. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so um, I'm going to put your panellists on the spot a little bit here. Um, bringing back to the topic of having an IP strategy, um, could you say, each of you, um, from either your individual experience or uh, industry knowledge, um, any anecdote where a, either a well-formulated IP strategy has been of great success to a fast-growing company, or, or perhaps even better gossip-wise, <laughs> if an uh, uh, equally poorly thought-out IP strategy has caused damage or a problem for, for the company? I'll start with John. Um, not a client of Clearview. Of course. So <laughs> easier to go there than, than uh, think about the client domain. Um, I think a company that's got probably one of the best IP strategies on the planet is Apple. Um, they've, they don't have a huge patent portfolio. Um, they've bought a, a few patents for a few billion over the years, um, but they absolutely control um, their IP like you wouldn't believe and they control mm. third-party IP and they have license rights to patent portfolios across the planet that you wouldn't imagine. Mm. Um, so they've secured freedom to operate um, at a very very low cost per phone um, and they've also controlled every aspect of core IP that matters to their business in terms of the amount of money they pay for cores at ARM mm. uh, for their core processor, what they've just done with imagination in Cambridge um, absolutely ruthless IP strategy, mm. but perfectly executed. Mm. And how many IP practitioners that work for Apple can you find on LinkedIn? Mm. Not many, right? How, ma how can you find the IP people that work for Apple? How can you talk to them about? Maybe the patent transaction guys, you can get to one or two of them when, when you're um, selling some IP that they really do want to mm. buy. But they've got it absolutely locked down. And that recent mm. PR stunt with the uh, father whose daughter saw, yeah. saw the, uh, the technology just before it was launched uh, is another example of keeping the shutters down on their, um, the IP that they control. So I think that's probably, for me, the best possible Great. example. Thanks. Nelly, do you have any um, thoughts? Let me go at it from a different angle, again, with one of the studies we've done. Uh, and the IP strategies, or maybe it's not IP strategy, maybe it's how the market or the world is. We, talk MS, we are talking SMEs. Mm -hmm. uh, one in three SMEs in the market answers to our studies with they have been subject of infringement uh, of their IP rights. Uh, now, can you make it not happen by having it better defined, by having it better controlled, by having better lawyers? I don't know. But as you can see, if it goes wrong, and it goes wrong apparently for one, one out of three, there is a cost involved mm. with that. So I think it's, it's, it's if, if I can summarize, it's, it's worth to get it right. Mm. Yeah. Margaret, you um, A kind of mixture of things. Um, OK, uh, the first thing I would think is IP strategy, regardless of whether you write it down or don't write it down or whatever, is it can't be static. Not for yeah, a, a fast-moving company. Mm -hmm. It just can't. Your commercial context yes. is changing, frankly, day by day. There will be one overriding concern that is generating revenue and recruiting enough staff to deliver. But aside from those basic uh, 
requirements, if you like, the IP strategy will reflect the broader context within which you're operating. So, for instance, if a competitor does send you an un unpleasant letter, you've got to be able to respond to that and have some idea of how you're going to respond to that. Similarly, for us, um, we saw the company recently, um, and one of the key things for us was keep your IP clean. Now, by that, I mean keep your ownership of your IP clean. Now, that might sound like an obvious thing to do, but it's not, because it can often be linked to corporate ownership and your corporate yeah. structure. Mm -hmm. So you have to understand the relationship between the different affiliates. You might think, how could a startup have affiliates? Yes, it can do, absolutely. <laughs> Just get it, get it cleaned up. Don't be stupid about it. Yeah. That's it. Thank, <laughs> you. Thank you very much. Um, we've got a few minutes left for questions, I believe. Um, so open to the audience. Does anyone have any questions for any of the panelists? We've got one over here. It's just a comment to pick up on your discussions regarding education. Um, there's some very interesting case studies have been published by the EPO in September for 12 SMEs across Europe where they looked at their IP management and IP strategies in terms of generating value for the business. Very easy to read case studies, but targeted at SMEs. And it's all to do with education, what you've been talking about. That's interesting. Thanks very much. I've got a question on um, the relationship between IP strategy and taxation. <laughs> um, yeah. Even in SMEs, um, I've seen some horrible, fictitious gains made at the tension point between our company is worth billions, Mr. VC, please give us some money. And later on, turns out our company is not worth billions, we need to restructure. But unfortunately, we've created a huge basis because we thought it was worth billions. Um, so in terms of SMEs and fast-moving companies, one of the things that can happen is that your, the level of optimism changes as you go through the company life cycle and the pivots, and the implied and actual value of your IP changes with it. And you can build some big holes in the ground for yourself. How do you account, think about that, do anything with it, or ignore it for your IP strategy? Thanks. Thank you. Um, we were talking earlier about your joyous <laughs> experiences with R&D tax credits. Yeah, so I mean, uh, I would almost suggest that s certainly from my experiences, the um, particular challenges have not necessarily been around IP strategy per se, it's been around R&D strategy. And by that I don't mean what are we going to, to devise next, but rather how, you, how do you account for R&D? So do you, do you capitalise it? Do you expense it? How long you amortise it over, and the you know the, the duration of your amortisation has to make some realistic representation of the technology space within your op which you're operating. The rules for R and D tax credits are quite complex, um, which we found out while we were going through the due diligence process, for finding out what is qualifying um, ex uh, expenditure and not. If there was one thing that would come out of this, I would say get absolute professional accountancy advice. You can't leave it to your normal uh, head of finance. This is a specialist area which goes beyond even normal taxation mm -hmm. advice. Yeah. Um, and similarly, uh, when I just briefly mentioned IP strategy in terms of keeping your stuff clean, be aware if you have international affiliates of the consequences of moving, moving IP and corporate structure and corporate ownership from one jurisdiction to the yeah. other. There are, are significant consequences on a yeah. taxation basis. Yeah. Thanks very much. Um, do you have any other questions? No. In that case, I think all that remains is for me to thank very much Nelly, John and Margaret, our panellists, and all of you for your time listening to us. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thanks very much.